Hey everybody, welcome back to my podcast, Anatomy and Physiology Bit by Bit. This is your host, Dr. Steve Sullivan, coming to you from the suburbs of Philadelphia. Uh, today's episode is a bonus episode. Um, this is not a particular content episode. Um, we finished up the muscular system in the last episode, number 16. And this one is about some of the rules that I try to use to inform my students uh, so that they can have kind of a perspective on the way the human body works. So when I teach my class, I typically stick to five rules that almost always apply to something in the human body. So we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, just want to thank you again for listening and and keeping up the downloads and and uh, hopefully you're handling the summer course as well. It is summer right now. And um, your location is handling the pandemic well, hopefully, and I hope that you are safe and healthy and we're going to get back to normalcy as soon as possible. Um, I know that I'll be teaching remotely, uh, at least for the fall semester of 2020. Um, I usually do teach online, but uh, I do like to teach my face-to-face -face class as well and do all my typical lab stuff, but um, it's just not going to happen this semester. Everybody needs to stay, to stay safe and well, and and we will eventually get back if we do things right. I think we'll get back to normal as soon as possible. But in the meantime, uh, let me get into some of the things that I like to tell my students. So some of these rules are things that you've heard before. It's not that big of a deal, like uh, it's not big a big surprise when you hear something like structure dictates function. Okay, so I've said that in the past and um, some people may not really love that phrase, but it really does apply in a lot of ways, especially when you're trying to learn anatomy and physiology. The anatomy of a structure usually will give you a big clue into what that piece does, right? So your eye has a clear cornea and a lens and sensory receptors. Um, a membrane might have a lot of receptors for a particular ligand. Um, you know, the, the structure of a bone, uh, where a muscle attaches to bones, what side of the bone it's on, and which joint it crosses will give you a lot of information into its function, right? If you look at the myofilaments of a skeletal muscle fiber, you can see that structure really lends to a particular function of shortening the sarcomere. Uh, so structure dictates function. That's a big one. I say that term a lot in my class. Another one I, I tell my students to remember, I tell them a lot of times, especially when we're in the cellular topics and talking about membrane transport, and uh, I tell them just remember from high to low, from high to low. When we have gradients, and our body works on gradients, as you know, um, concentration gradients, pressure gradients, electrical gradients, that typically the net movement of materials is from the area of high pressure or high concentration to the area of low pressure or low concentration. That is diffusion. And things move from high to low, even osmosis, right? So you hear about osmosis and you think, well, in osmosis, the water moves to the area of low concentration. Well, that's true, but if you think about it, it's the water is moving from the area of high water concentration to the area of low water concentration. So I think I misspoke a second ago. So the, the water typically moves to the area of the higher solute concentration. And that's true. But think about it. When something, when a solution has a, has a high solute concentration, it means that the water concentration is low. And when it has a low solute concentration, the water concentration is high. So in osmosis, when water moves from the area of low concentration to the area of high concentration, that's the solute concentration they're talking about. It's still moving down its own concentration gradient from high water to low water. So from high to low, every time I ask them a question, I throw a question out in class, what direction is this going to move? And they want to tell me it's going to move up, it's going to move inside, it's going to move outside, it's going to move to the left of the screen that you're pointing to or whatever. Just tell me from high to low, right? From high to low, that's where it's going to move. That's a good way to think about it. Uh, I also tell them 
Location, location, location. So you've heard that rule as far as real estate. Location, location, location. Um, that rule also applies to a lot of the questions that you hear about in the human body. So think about water and fluid in the human body, body fluids. What's the difference between blood plasma and interstitial fluid and cytosol and cerebrospinal fluid and lymph and urine and peritoneal fluid and pericardial fluid, all these different fluids we have. And what's the difference between one and the other? Well, start with location, location, location. What makes blood plasma blood plasma and interstitial fluid interstitial fluid? It's their location. Blood plasma is blood plasma when it's in the bloodstream. But that blood plasma diffuses or flows out of the capillaries into the interstitial fluid and it becomes interstitial fluid. And when that when fluid gets reabsorbed from the cells into the back into the bloodstream, it's blood plasma again. And that interstitial fluid is going to permeate the plasma membrane of the cell and become cytosol. Or it might go into the lymphatic organs and, and vessels and become lymph, right? And so um, blood, uh, blood plasma might get filtered out of a choroid plexus in a lateral ventricle of your brain and become cerebrospinal fluid. So now these different fluids have different concentrations of things and all that stuff, but start with location, location, location. Another example is some of our chemicals in our body are chemical signals and messengers or hormones, or neurotransmitters. Uh, what's the difference? Because some are both. Dopamine can be a hormone or a neurotransmitter. Well, when is it when? Or when is it which? And the answer is location, location, location. If it's in the bloodstream, it's a hormone. If it's in a synaptic cleft, it's a neurotransmitter. Right? So location, location, location. The next one I like to tell people is move it or lose it. And move it or lose it means basically your body has a uh, an energy economy that it has to budget and take care of. And it has to make sure that there's enough energy to go around to maintain all the tissues. It, you have to spend a good number of calories. Your basal metabolic rate, you have to spend a good number of calories just to keep your cells and tissues alive every day. And if you're not using particular cells and tissues... Your body's not going to bother spending the energy to maintain them. So think about muscles. Um, if you are uh, really big on working out and you're going to the gym a lot and you're lifting and you're getting big and strong, if you take six months off, you will lose strength. You'll lose size. You will what's called atrophy. Those muscles will shrink. There is no point in your body maintaining those muscles if you are not using them. So we have atrophy. The same thing happens with glands. If you are injecting something um, into your body that your body would normally make on its own, your negative feedback systems are going to kick in and your body's not going to bother making it. And if your body's not making it, those cells are not active and your body won't bother maintaining those cells. And if you stop taking that injection, you might have a problem because now you've become dependent upon it. And so your cells are not ready to start producing right away just because you've stopped taking them. So we have atrophy of glands and muscles and bones even, right? So one of the problems that astronauts have when they're in a low gravity environment for a prolonged period of time is loss of bone density. The body's not going to bother maintaining your bone density if you're not doing weight-bearing activity with those bones. So oh, move it or lose it is another big one. I tell my students. And finally, the last one, the fifth rule of A&P is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's similar to move it or lose it, but basically if you think about um, how much blood you have circulating in your body, right? So you've got X amount of blood circulating in your body. And if you start exercising, you need to, to bring more oxygen and glucose to the muscles that you're using, and you need to be able to pull more waste products away uh, at a faster rate. You can't make more blood for that right away. So what you do instead is you constrict the blood vessels that go to the non-essential parts of your body at the moment, 
and you dilate the blood vessels that go to those muscles you're working at the moment. So we will divert the blood flow to those areas and restrict the blood flow to other areas. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Whatever needs it at the moment is going to get what you got. So think about frostbite. When you hear about people who are trapped in, um, in the cold, the frostbite typically affects their fingers, toes, tip of their nose first, the extremities. And the reason for that is because it's much more important to keep the core of your body warm, your vital organs, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your digestive system, right? You got to keep those warm. So we, we draw the blood away from the extremities so that we can focus on the part that needs it the most. And then what happens is the extremities get sacrificed to the cold. Um, so just another example of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. But that's all about, an, an, again, about the resources that you have available in your body and what the needs are throughout your body. So five rules that I typically tell my students throughout the course of the semester that they should be looking at. Structure dictates function from high to low, location, 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 move it or lose it, and the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you can keep those five rules in your head, I think that you can apply that to most things you'll see in anatomy and physiology. So um, so thanks for tuning in for this bonus episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it helps you with your course. I want to thank you all again for listening. I want to thank you for maybe going on the... Um, wherever you get your podcasts and rating the show, um, rate the podcast, tell your professors, tell your friends, tell your classmates. Um, the more listeners, the better. That would be great. Um, like I've said before, I'm never going to charge for this podcast. I would love it if um, I'm never going to ask you for donations. I would love it if I got enough listeners to put put a quick little sponsor up to help cover the costs of of the equipment and the and the hosting. But um uh, but listeners is the way to go. So post the link to this podcast on your learning management system in a discussion board or email it to your friends and, and suggest it to your professor to share with the class, especially in this age of online learning that is going to be taking over for the foreseeable future. Um, I'm hoping that if you feel this podcast has helped you with your course, um, best way for me to make more episodes as quickly as possible is for me to get a big demand for it. So I hope you're doing well. Please enjoy uh, the rest of your summer if you're listening to this in the summer and good luck on your next exam. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, don't forget to check out my YouTube channel, Student Help for AP. Student Help, the number four, AP. There's a lot of tutor videos on there that I think could be really helpful. I also have an Instagram account and a Twitter feed with the same name. Anatomy and Physiology Bit by Bit is a production of Minus 55 Media, with a special thanks to Bucks County Community College, McGraw-Hill Higher Education, and my family.